Welcome to the second episode of Faking It, a podcast based on the notion that we're all just getting through life experience by experience and collectively figuring out what we're doing as we go. Improvisation at its highest degree, faking it till we make it. This week, I'll be talking to an old friend of mine, Davy Jones. He's a musician, a tool and die maker, and an all around awesome guy. He's got some amazing travel stories and life stories for you all. So stick around. I'm your host, Liz Hudson, and this is Faking It. All right, I'd like to welcome uh, Davy Jones to the podcast. Hi, Davy. Howdy. Uh, Dave is a longtime friend of mine from high school, so it's been over a decade that we've known each other, which is spooky. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit spooky. <laughs> and uh, Davy Jones is a musician and uh, full-time tool and die maker, but makes um, a lot of cool music and actually did the theme music for our uh, intro of this and is going to do some more music for us, so it's good. Um, right. yeah. So thanks for that, by the way, you're hey, an awesome no, friend. <laughs> no problem. I'm happy to help and be a part of it. Right on. I'd love to, uh, ask you about how like music fits into your life because I find everybody who's an artist always has a bit of an issue trying to figure out like how to balance, like making money and being mm-hmm. artistic. And, uh, I think that you do that really well. So how does yeah. that, how does it fit? Thanks. Uh, That's actually an awesome question to ask because it's one that I ask myself pretty often. (laughs) Um, It might seem that I kind of have a pretty good balance. Uh, Currently, though, I'm definitely more so in the side of playing music to make money as opposed to it being uh, more of like a creative expression, Uh, which for all artists is the whole reason why you do it, you know? So... uh, I play a lot of like the local venues and bars and pubs and just kind of play the local scene to make some decent cash on the side. And and I really do love joy. I really do love doing it, like getting up on stage in front of people. I think it's a, it's a blast, man. It's so fun to perform. Awesome. So how did that, uh, how did your relationship with music begin? Like uh, for as long as I can remember, it's been a part of your life, but how did that begin? Yeah, it's a huge part of my life. Um, It started, um, my father was a pianist. He was actually uh, the pianist in a rock band back in the 70s called Lone Star. Uh, Oh, right on. Yeah, they were the opening act for Ted Nugent, who, uh, that's a name that, you know, dropping name bombs here that people might recognize. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But yeah, they were like a killer rock band. So my dad had like the best licks when it came to playing piano. And I would always like just watch in awe when he would shred, shred the ivory. So I think he was my main inspiration from a really young age. And then uh, when my mom remarried, she married a drummer who was also extremely musical. So I had that aspect of it too. And he had an old Yamaha guitar just kind of sitting behind the couch in the upstairs living room at home. And one day I decided to pick it up and noodle around with it and found out how much I loved it. And that was, I don't know, man, I was probably like, geez, maybe like 10, 11. And uh, it's been on and off. Like I've I've been really serious with it for like a year or two. And then I'd kind of fall out for a couple months. But I always always end up going back to it. So (laughs) that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's been a really cool thing actually to uh I think that you're my only friend that I've been able to watch consistently um progress with a certain thing like like a, an instrument. So there's people who kind of like in waves get into something and then they drop it and then they I don't know, I can't say I I have a lot of people in my kind of <laughs> wheelhouse of of uh friends and and family that I've seen go from, you know, noodling around, not that I knew you when you were 10 or 11, but you were pretty new to it when I knew you, um, to like performing and like making a business out of it. Yeah. So it's really cool. That's awesome. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Yeah. You're doing an awesome job and, uh, you're, you're kind of, um, you've gone through a bit of a, of an experience from a couple years ago. I don't, it probably been about four years ago, five years Mm ago, I'd say that Mm -hmm. you, um, sort of divorced from a regular nine to five and went to try to make me like, you know, full-time music, your thing and uh, making money at it. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure thing. Yeah. I was living in Brampton with a couple of buddies. We were renting a place together 
And I was just at the end of getting my uh, ticket in Tool and Die. Is it a journeyman site type thing? Yeah, yeah. Qualifi- your certificate of qualifications. That's what it is. Um, so I always knew that I just wanted to get it because I had started it and I had done really well with it. So I was like, why am I just going to drop this right now? You know? So uh, I finished it up. And then as soon as I finished, I actually quit my job. Uh, I sold a lot of my possessions. I bought a plane ticket to Halifax and I hitchhiked across Canada. And the whole idea was kind of just like, to, for one, to see my own country. Um, I find it really interesting when people are talking about traveling and exploring and they have all these amazing stories about traveling like Vietnam or the uh, uh, Europe or something like that. Or, you know what I mean? These really other really cool, amazing places. Totally. Yeah. Um, yet they don't really understand what they have in their own backyard. And I want to do way more traveling in my life. And with that, I want to be able to go to those other places and be like, yo, this is what Canada is like because I've seen it. You know? Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's a definitely important to see Canada. That's something I, I've always treasured as well. For sure. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of like the start of that whole journey. And I wanted to see music all across Canada and different aspects and become influenced and uh, motivated. And then when I moved back, I moved back to Toronto with the intention of just playing music full time. Like that was going to be the only thing that I did. And I did for a while. I think I, I, I did it for about nine months, nine, eight, nine, eight or nine months. And, uh, it was decent. It was, I now understand the term, uh, or I now understand the whole concept of like a struggling musician because yeah. whole, you are living to paycheck to paycheck, man. It is it is tight. <laughs> um, but it was really cool, man. It was just so cool to be like, hey, I am actually able to make money doing this and enough money to live relatively comfortable. I had a house. I had groceries in the in the fridge every day, you know, I could, I could wake up and do some cool things and then go play at night. And it was like, I was living an awesome life. But for me, it was, for one, there there was definitely like, um, I was losing a lot of that passion for the music, uh, because it had just become a job and I couldn't just be like, Oh, Hey guys, you want to get together and jam tonight and have some fun? It's like, Oh no, I, I got to go make money because I want to eat tomorrow. So I think that it, what was so interesting to me was you, we maybe touched base a couple months later and you were just like, yeah, man, it kind of like totally, you know, nullifies your, your, your spark. If you're like, yeah, so today I'm going to play music, but it's to make money. So it, it, it became a little bit more of a not I, it's probably never forced for you, but I wonder, like, did you did you feel it was a little bit hard at the end there to, like, keep trying to go out and, and make money doing something that you just like to kind of pick up and play with? Yeah, 100 percent. It definitely got to the point where I knew I would have a gig at night and I dreaded it. I didn't want to go and play. I was just like, oh, anything, anything but this, you know. Uh, That's the worst. So that totally, totally sucks. Um, I think, too, another side of it is that, yeah, although it did take some of the passion out of it, um, there was also an aspect of, like, me just not committing to it 100%. And I know that had I really explored all of the different avenues that I could have taken... um, and really dedicated, you know, a solid, a solid six hours a day to just mastering the craft and then going out and playing at night as if it were a full-time job, I would be 10, time the mus- 10 times the musician today that I, than I actually am. So I kind of kick myself for not fully committing to it um, as diligently as I could have, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, learning experiences and things. (laughs) We can't always, it can't always be perfect. But um, I'm wondering what's changed now though, because you're a full-time tool and die maker. Is that right? You're like full-time at, yeah. So a full-time tool and die maker. um, And you uh, actually, I probably should ask you to explain for the people who don't know, what (laughs) what is a tool and die maker? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Tool and die maker. Uh, it is, we basically build molds and dyes that form things, which sounds super vague. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure I just confused everyone a whole lot more. Uh, but take, for example, a fork. Uh, it's a piece of metal that's been formed into its shape and it's been cut out. It was cut out of a piece of sheet metal, right? So there had to be some sort of metal stamping machine that would stamp those forks out and form that little kind of groove that like 
you know, that... Uh, makes a fork a fork. Uh, makes a fork a fork, <laughs> yeah. So I would be the guy who would design and build the tool that would stamp out forks. But it's for everything, man. You Everything around you, anything made of plastic that has any kind of shape was formed or molded in something. And that came from a tool that a tool and die maker would make. Right on. Yeah. So you're doing that full time, and but also music, and quite mm. a lot of music. Yeah. I mean, maybe you feel like you could be doing more, because I think that's kind of your personality, to be like, yeah, I'm doing this, but I could be doing more. Yeah. But I feel <laughs> like uh, you're always, like I've always, I'm always hearing about a gig you're doing, or like an open mic or something you're hosting, like you're hosting, you're playing, you have these awesome little challenges that I think you give yourself for online content, which we'll get into, but... <laughs> Um, yeah. So how are you feeling like now you're doing both and it seems like you're doing pretty good at both. Like what's the, is there a struggle there? Is it something you love? Like what, what's the difference now? I think going back to tool and die was one of those things. The grass is always greener, man. When I was a tool and die maker, I wanted to be a musician. When I was a musician, I was like, forget this. I want to go back to doing tool and die. Right. Um, but one thing that I do know for certain is that I do, uh, like comfort. And I am a very financially driven person, uh, not to say that I'm greedy per se, but that I'm ambitious <laughs> and, uh, I really want to be financially successful in my life. Um, and owning a house is one of those, those huge life goals that I've always wanted. And since I was like 16, man, I've been socking money away. I've been saving. So it's awesome. My fiance and I just purchased our first house last year. And Congratulations. It's a beautiful home. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was one of those things that was like, yeah, you know, it, that, that's a goal that's really important to me. And I'm willing to go back to Tool and Die and have that, that 40 hour a week gig. Um, yet still play music on the side because it's really what I love to do. And, um, for sure. And it's cool right now. It's a good balance. Like I, I generally work Monday to Friday, 40 hours a week. And then I play Thursday, Friday, Saturday, sometimes Sunday. Um, and yeah, it can get busy and there are times where I'm just like, man, I wish I could kick back and watch Netflix, but, <laughs> 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 but I wouldn't change it, man. Not at all. That's great. And now you're kind of also branching off into um, doing wedding performances or like events type stuff. Is that something that you're you're like excited? You have kind of prospect that it might be a full time thing or like what are you trying to do now with that? Yeah, that's um, exactly what I'm doing. I'm totally like rebranding, uh, trying to sell myself to a different market. I don't want to do the bar gigs anymore. The way that I see it is that I can play a wedding or a private function or a corporate event. Um, which would essentially be the same amount of time as a bar gig, but I'd be getting paid two to three times more money, which uh, in the way that I see it is it's like I can either play less and have more time to do other really cool uh, activities or whatever it is that I want to go with, or I can play just as much and make that much more money, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. I, I feel you there with, I think, the respect to corporate film or photo gigs that I've gotten and things that are obviously independent or like, oh, can you help a brother out? Like I need, you know, this little thing made. Hmm. So obviously at certain points you feel like, I don't know, I guess the corporate like film and photography world is probably a lot more soul sucking than like going to somebody's awesome wedding and playing music for them. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I feel yeah. like, um, I sometimes do the same thing. I wager, wager it and I go, you know, am I going to spend this time? I probably don't say no to those small time gigs because I do really love doing them. But, you know, I overload mm -hmm. on some things, but I, I might like, you know, uh, really enjoy doing the corporate stuff because I think it's also important to understand that world and not just go like, yeah, I'm just doing this independent thing, you know, like hustling. You know, you can also hustle as an artist and like do corporate stuff and kick ass and you know, make paper. <laughs> yeah, straight up. <laughs> so my next question about your challenges, like your online things, I've seen you do a lot of like, uh, like there's like a request fest type thing or you'll um, challenge yourself like quite verbally to be like, mm -hmm. I am going to do this. Like, uh, please people hold me to this. This is my, my goal and I'm going to succeed in, you know, putting out a, a song a week or requ people request a song and you play it and you film a little thing for it. So you're like social media presence is strong and everything. So how, how are you, what's mm -hmm. the purpose of that? Is that just like a strategy for you for social media or do you do that to keep yourself sort of in check to like you owe somebody something? I think it's a bit of both. Um, 
Social accountability is massive, uh, especially when you say you're going to do something uh, and you actually want to be held responsible to doing it. It's really easy to say to yourself, hey, I'm going to do this and then just totally screw off and not do it, you know? Uh, so by making it publicly known, it's a lot harder for me to dip out because I'm dip not just dipping out on myself, but on everybody else who's following me and expecting something from me and like hoping for me to produce, you know, a video or a song or whatever. Um, I struggle with it, man, though. It is so hard, especially, especially with that request fest thing where I would pop up three songs and have, uh, my audience kind of say, oh, hey, you learn this one. And then I'd learn it and record it. And I was doing it once a week. But with the full-time job and with uh, lots of music on the side, plus the rest life. of life, yeah, <laughs> like not even including my relationship or we have a couple dogs and the fitness is big in our home too. Like that's, there's so many aspects of life that really just kind of add to it. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a challenge for sure. And I, I, I want to, to do it for the people who follow me and I want to keep them happy and keep them, you know, jiving along with me and bobbing their heads <laughs> to the music. So, yeah, I think that that's kind of the main thing right there. Awesome. Yeah. So you were saying, uh, did you play any music when you were doing your hitchhiking across, uh, when you like got into Halifax and you kind of just like headed out? Did you, you saw a lot of music you said, but I'm wondering, did you play any music at all while you were out there? I bought myself a little ukulele in Halifax, actually, uh, because I was living out of a backpack. I didn't want to be the hitchhiker that was like, oh, here, take my massive backpack and a guitar as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so thoughtful. Yeah. Well, I was trying. <laughs> uh, so I figured a ukulele, I could stuff it into my backpack and kind of make totally. it work. Yeah. Uh, so I played a little bit. Plus, I had never played the uke, so I thought it was a wicked opportunity for me to learn a new instrument. Um, Definitely. Which I still totally suck at. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so what, what was like a lot of your time doing the, the backpacking across Canada? Like, uh, so you went from Halifax, where did you end up? Yeah, sure. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Brett, he and I planned to do this whole trip together. So we flew out to Halifax together, started there. Uh, and then we started making our way west. And I think we made it all the way to Ottawa. And then he had to go back home. That, that was over the course of like two or three weeks. Uh, all hitchhikes, by the way. Like, no, we didn't catch a train, didn't grab a bus. That was just sticking our thumb at the side of the road and getting picked up by randos. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Well, you have to go into that a little bit more. Sure. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, he had to fly back at that point. And I was like, okay, well, I'm on my own now. Uh, and I, my best friend, my dearest friend in the world, Ben is living up in Yellowknife and I was like, man, I got to see him. I'm doing this trip across Canada. I can't not go and see him, you know? Yeah. So I bought a ticket, flew up there. Uh, the plane landed at two in the morning uh, and being midsummer that far north, it was still light out as if it was dusk or dawn or something. Wow. It was like the eeriest thing, man, stepping off the plane being like, it's the middle of the night and it looks like the morning. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, so I spent a week with him there. Then I flew out to Vancouver, and then at that point, I started hitchhiking my way back to Ontario, uh, made a whole bunch of stops along the way, saw some incredible routes through the Rockies. Oh, man, like, I could just spend my life driving those mountains. They're absolutely incredible. Sounds fantastic. Um, yeah, it really was. Ended up making it all the way back to Regina, uh, at which point I ran out of money, as many people do. <laughs> And <laughs> oh, that fun time where you're like, so <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. What do I do now? Yeah. Thankfully, I had rationed just enough for a Greyhound bus back Ooh, to Toronto. Lucky. And, uh, yeah. So that definitely saved my skin for sure. Well, you <laughs> sort of planned well. Or maybe there was somebody on your side. Who knows? Yeah, that's that's wicked. So do you have any like notable hitchhiking stories I completely by the way forgot that you did this like I <laughs> completely forgot like you're telling me and I'm like oh my god right this whole thing um yeah. so yeah what a life already but uh yeah so any notable like hitchhiking either great or weird sure yeah uh for the most part you know it wasn't it wasn't bad at all I can't believe how there's such like a negative outlook on hitchhiking um I think it took me from the, tr the amount of traveling that I did with hitchhiking, it, I ended up 
totaling like 38 different rides from people. Right on. And just statistically, with the reputation that hitchhiking has, you would think, okay, 38 rides, there's got to be at least a couple really bad experiences. Like in at there. least one serial killer. I mean, yeah, yeah right. You know, <laughs> you know yeah, like, like, like on statistically speaking, <laughs> there's been like one or a, one and a half serial killers out there. Like who's going to pick you up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just narrowly escaping with my life. Right. Lucky, like, lucky. No, no serial killers who had a thing for like killing backpackers with ukuleles. Cause then you'd be totally screwed. <laughs> I'd be done, man. <laughs> Uh, but it was man, like the, it's the people are incredible who pick you up and they're just like all walks of life. I got picked up by a young woman, early twenties, with her two kids in the back seat, who were uh, the one kid was one and the other kid was two and a half. Wow, like, I mean, you know, she was by herself, completely ooh. by herself, and you just think to yourself, so you just who wonder in the right minds would you know? Yeah, but I then, mean, just the risk. I mean, also as a female oh, too, but like, yeah. wow, okay. So that one was really cool. I got picked up by this awesome lady, this total hippie chick uh, named Lisa when I was out. Uh, I was traveling from Squamish to, oh, Squamish. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Somewhere, somewhere on the West Coast. Squamish there. and. <laughs> yeah. I th- maybe Revelstoke or something. Okay. Um, so she picked me up and we just went for a cruise and it was like, she ended up driving me like three and a half hours or something. And we went we took this long route through the mountains. It was called the Duffies and it was just, it blew my mind. Just the experience of that drive and the scenery and then having someone like that cool to share it with, you know, it was like, totally. Yeah. Such a surreal experience. Um, I had one truck driver try to pick me up and not just in pick me up to drive me. This is the story I remember. (laughs) Yeah. This is the one I remember. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it was, yeah, it was really odd. He, uh, he picked me up in this truck. It was like a big, massive cube van, but like an 18, 20 footer, like one of the big ones. And he was definitely delivering, he was delivering beer to the beer store. Um, and so where he picked me up to his first drop off point was like an hour and it was all good. We were just shooting the shit, super cool guy, had some awesome stories of himself, like had lived a pretty wild life. And then we got into town, he dropped off his beer, and then we continued on to the next town. Uh, And it was at that point, like during that next stretch of the road where uh, our conversation kind of dipped into like some more personal stuff and not like anything weird or odd, but just like family issues or like friends and just some more personal things. Um, And somehow we had gotten on the topic of like his brother was gay. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, I've got an uncle that's gay and this and that. And and then a little bit further down the road, he was like, so um, you want to give me a hand job? (laughs) (laughs) Just going, going for it, man. Went for it. And when I was talking about my brother, what I meant was it's me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So naturally at that point, I was like, uh, I respectfully decline. This Um, is my stop. Yes, exactly. (laughs) I must get out. I would really like to get out now. Uh, At which point he was like just beaming red, went super red, was so So maybe he just totally read it wrong. And he's probably in honest, like, you know, he's probably had a lot of those experiences work out for him. I mean, from what I've heard, you know, it's lonely (laughs) on the road. So, I mean... Uh, yeah, he probably felt really bad. Luckily, it's not a forceful situation. So that's good that you got out of it. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, it, yeah, he just felt so horrible. And he was like, I'm so sorry. We're like five minutes to the next town. I'll drop you off there. He's like, I did not mean to make you feel uncomfortable at all. Good thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. At which point I was like, OK, I'm 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 safe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, but that's all right. That that's I mean, that's the only thing that's pretty good. I mean, that's tame. Yeah. Uh, but, you oh. know, <laughs> um, did you do you actually like keep in touch with with anybody from the road like did you get any like not just from hitchhiking but maybe from your travels since you've been to a few different places is there anybody you keep in touch with you know what it's funny you say that uh because there's not a single person who i have stayed connected with and i totally kick myself for it man because every single per- person that i got a ride with or had met i i took everyone's contact information down uh especially the really cool ones who were people who i would want to stay in touch with you know especially the hand job guy <laughs> oh yeah hey buddy how you hey, doing i'm lonely <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's yeah maybe i don't know maybe one day you'll uh you'll get back in touch with some of them yeah i've got all the numbers so That'd be hey, pretty why cool not? 
So, uh, so that, that pretty, uh, pretty much articulates your adventurous nature, I think. I think um, so. <laughs> so uh, I want to go to a different topic now that's a little bit in that vein, and uh, that's drugs. Yeah. And there's some uh, some interesting stories I think that um, that you have that uh, are of note probably within your life and maybe how they change your life, you know, change your outlook and stuff. So is there, you know, a place you'd like to start talking about sort of like your journey with that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I was always intrigued by drugs from, I would probably say about the age of 16, 17, 18 or so, Mm -hmm. the high school days really. Um, And it was, it's the standard thing, you know, you go to a party, you have beer for the first time, you you have some Smirnoff ices. (laughs) (laughs) Oh God, Smirnoff ices. And realize that, hey, you know, being drunk is kind of fun. Right. Uh, and then it was, uh, I tried smoking weed for the first time. Um, and most people say that they didn't get high the first time they smoked. Let me tell you, I got fucking ripped. <laughs> <laughs> enough that you remember it being a, a memorable thing, huh? Yeah, enough that it actually scared the heck out of me. And I didn't touch it for two years after the first time I tried it. Um, but then I did eventually give it a second shot and found out that, okay, well, in moderation, it's not such a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, I definitely went through some years of exploration. It was mainly uh, just smoking weed and um, magic mushrooms were kind of the two go-tos. Everything else, I mean, I've tried a couple other things, but nothing that's really ever resonated with me, uh, just like those two Okay, guys, I'm pausing here for a short second. I don't currently have any sponsorship for this podcast, but if I did, this is likely where the shout out to them would go. Faking it promotes a healthy and positive lifestyle. I can see us representing anything from health, alternative lifestyle, travel, and overall personal well-being products. So if you yourself have a small business or work for a big one, or maybe know somebody else who might be interested in placing their ad here, please drop us a message through our email faking it podcast at gmail.com or on our website www.fakingitpodcast.com under the sponsorship tab i'd love to hear from you i'm not gonna lie there was definitely a period in my life where i was smoking way too often man like waking up and it was first thing i would think about in the morning and then i would either go to school or go to work and if I was, you know, that was the one thing is I, I never went to work high ever uh, just because of the dangerous nature of the job and being a musician and working with those machi- machines, I, uh, I value my fingers. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to have a mold made out of your own hand. <laughs> no. This is Dave Warstoff's <laughs> mold, yeah. his hand mold. And now he's... <laughs> we make, we actually use this mold to make his prosthetic. <laughs> yeah. So it worked out okay. Exactly. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. A smart, smart move. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it got out of hand. There was a yeah a point in my life where I was smoking way too much, and it was all I was doing. You know, I'd finish school or I'd finish uh, work and come home and be like, "All right, well, I'm gonna go hang out with buddies. We're gonna smoke weed and we're gonna lounge out and watch TV, or we would jam. We jammed a lot of the time when we were stoned, so yeah. there was a semi-productive nature to it." But even still, it's a lot of years of my life that I look back and just kind of shake my head and go, man, I really wish I was, I really wish I had it a little more together back then, you know? Yeah. Do you, well, do you find that that's a regret or do you find that like often enough, if there's things in my life that I look back and go like, oh, that wasn't great. I don't know if I regret them per se, but like I might look at it as like, well, that was the learning thing or like the catalyst that made me go we need to sort your shit out or you need to try to do this thing better. So I don't necessarily regret it, but I find that a lot of people do have that, like, you know, uh, like a feeling of regret that they you, like, why was it, wasn't I, you know, on, on top of those things earlier. Do you feel regret for that, for like, you know, those periods? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there, uh, where there's aspects of it that I regret. Um, and, but I definitely see, uh, some silver lining in it as well. Um, in what I learned and took from it um, as like a whole experience. Uh, And then at the same time too, as I mentioned, like we would smoke and we would jam and we would do that for like three, four hours a night. 
like five nights a week. So the amount of musicianship that I possess today, I know stemmed from a lot of those years of just driving, 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 practicing, 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 even though it was just like stone jams, you know, but really it is, it, it's practice. So something good came of it for sure. Totally. So in that, like you're learning experiences with uh, something a little harder than weed, like with mm-hmm. mushrooms. Firstly, did you uh, did you use these recreationally like a lot or was it something that was like, you know, you can count on your hand how many times you've done Mushrooms it? Mushrooms was one of those things where I think it was the same group of guys uh, who I would do it with. Um, and we probably did it four or five times a year. Uh, over the course of like maybe three a three year span kind of thing, so it was never it was never uh, like a weekly thing or we I think we all had our heads on straight enough to know that that would mess us up pretty permanently uh, and it wasn't something that any of us really wanted no matter how fun of an experience it might have been um, or terrifying because well anyone who's experienced them knows that. They can be just as bad as they are good. <laughs> so was there like kind of a worthwhile story of anything that occurred while you were on <laughs> mushrooms that, you know, freaked you out or maybe was a learning experience for you or maybe, you know, where you stopped using them, like something like that? Yep. I've got uh, two experiences that I'd love to touch on. Uh, the first is uh, a mushroom trip that I did with a couple buddies at the University of Guelph. Uh, we all got together and we were hanging out for the weekend. We drove up and we drove up full, with the full intention of getting mushrooms and getting right ripped. <laughs> so <laughs> we all got together. Uh, we got the mushrooms. And the f- first thing I noticed was when I looked at the mushrooms, I was like, these are really weird looking. They're a lot different than any kind of mushrooms I've seen. Like in what way? Was there like a color difference? It was or? the shape and size of them. Um, there, I mean, there are so many different types of psilocybin produci- producing mushrooms um, and they all have varying effects. Uh, so obviously the ones that we had gotten up here in Guelph were much different than anything that we had previously tried. They're really thin, kind of stick-like, whereas we were used to like the really thick, white, stocked kind of with blue stains on them, you know, like just, Mm -hmm. I can't shoot names out for you, but, uh, yeah. So you just, you just saw that they were, they were quite different. Very different. Um, yeah. Did that freak you out? Like when you saw them or were you excited to be like, Oh, it's a new thing. Or were you kind of like, did you anticipate, Oh, this might be different or was it just not even, not even a thought. I thought was like, wow, they're different. Okay, well let's do it. Uh, and, uh, at that point we had all been, Pretty, we were all pretty experienced with uh, mushrooms, so we were like, okay, well, let's do, uh, let's have a, a hefty night, and uh, we all decided to do four grams, uh, which is for those of you that don't know, uh, insane. <laughs> <laughs> One gram is enough to make you friggin' go off your knocker. So uh, to have four is, ooh, yeah, I don't even know. I don't even know what I was thinking. <laughs> so being this kind of odd uh, variety of mushrooms, I it had a different effect for sure. Uh, a more, much more potent effect than I had ever experienced. Um, I remember laying on my friend's bed, just, we were listening to some like really funky out there jazz. And it was almost as if we were in the dorm, by the way, uh, we were in his dorm room. Oh God. (laughs) So, uh, contained locked spaces. Right. (laughs) That doesn't sound great. Yeah. Five guys in a room, the size of a closet tripping yeah. out on mushrooms not a good scene <laughs> Ooh, no that doesn't sound good so uh it was almost as if something just kind of like clicked in my head oh, and shit. uh i got up and i walked out of the room and i started wandering around the halls of the school um and i was just so out of it like it, it was such a lucid state uh i can't even say that i was 100 percent coherent it was definitely a partially out of body experience it was really really odd wow um so I'm were wa- you like the, uh, the, the behaving completely different than your buddies or well that's the thing is i have no idea they didn't see anything in me because as soon as it happened i left i was just like i need out of here 
they figured I, I, they said that I had left really abruptly and they figured, oh, he's just going to the bathroom. He has to throw up or something. But right. then like 20, 30, 40 minutes goes by and they're like, well, I don't know if he's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and bad experience, bad, uh, bad feeling. Lost friend who's yeah. currently tripping balls. Yeah. And they are currently tripping balls at the same time. It would not be oh. nice for them. So where did that adventure uh, take you? You were, did you stay within the dorm or did you adventure outwards? Yeah. Well, for the most part, I stayed within the dorm. I was just kind of wandering through the halls, randomly talking with people. Um, And then I remember walking down a hallway and it was almost as if, imagine an open book in front of you and on the page, the farthest right hand side of the right page was uh, one minute and then a timeline stretches across the book to the far left-hand side of the left-hand page, which is a minute 30. It was almost as if someone took the book and just slammed it shut. So time literally was just sliced. And I was at one moment in one spot and then at a second moment in a completely different spot with zero recollection of what had happened in between. That sounds terrifying. Yeah. Like, uh, especially... That's terrifying. (laughs) Because I just, I, I don't know... I feel like your heart would just be beating so fast because you'd be so friggin' confused. Yeah. Uh, And it was especially um, frightening when I came to and I was in a stairwell and there was a guy screaming at me and yelling and he's pushing me and he's like, what the fuck, man? What what the fuck? And I I was like, whoa, I don't know what's going on, man. But hey, like no troubles. I do not want to fight because you will whoop me right now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and he threw a punch. He got me above the eye. He threw another punch and he broke my nose. Uh, Whoa. Yeah, man. Just like full out. Uh, and at this point, uh, TA came into the stairwell and they looked at me and they were like, dude, you're messed up. You got to leave or we're going to call the cops. And I was like, did you not just see this guy like, like break my, my face? nose? Yeah. Uh, so anyways, I was like, no troubles, no troubles. Uh, I walked to the bottom of the stairwell uh, and there was a door that actually led outside. Um, once I stepped outside, there was kind of like this this overhang, this like awning almost. Uh, and then that led to the main road that ran through the campus of the university. Uh, and I was standing underneath this this little overhang and I was totally mesmerized by like a pizza pizza box in the garbage can or something. <laughs> <laughs> Are you just like bleeding like profusely out of your nose just wandering around looking at pizza boxes or you know you like not bleeding oh i was i must have been pissing blood uh it was all over me the next day so i definitely was but i was just so out of it i had no idea i was it like it was as if the pain didn't register and as if the dripping of the blood wasn't even it just wasn't there you know so i'm standing there and a police car rolls up and uh, a female and a male cop get out of the car and they walk over to me and they were like, sir, how much you had to drink tonight? And me in my ridiculous state looks up at them and goes, four grams of mushrooms. Oh, <laughs> brutal. <laughs> so Stupid naturally. Stupid mushroom brain. Don't uh, tell the truth. Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> though they probably did kind of save your ass, though. <laughs> 100%. Because, like, the- you, you just made it outside of the, the doors of the residence. And I mean, like, what would have happened, you know? You said it, man. That residence was like the safe haven kind of thing. Right. As soon as I left, it was, yeah, unknown territory. So naturally, they cuffed me and they threw me in the back of the cop car. Uh, and first off, they took me to the police station just to like search me, which they did. And I had nothing on me. I just had a wallet and I think my cell phone or whatever. And then they took me from there back to the hospital to have my face checked out. Uh, and I remember sitting in the, the waiting room with the female cop and I was just like, so tell me, what's it like to be a cop? <laughs> <laughs> You're just like interviewing them and totally. like, so tell me about this. Yeah. How do you, how do you just, like using a gun? Like just <laughs> not registering that you probably are in a lot of shit. Yeah. Ex- just, yeah. I was, yeah. had no idea. Uh, needless to say, she was having none of it. <laughs> oh, really? Eh? Yeah. Oh. just like cold shoulder uh yeah well it's a it's a university like town right so they probably deal with a lot of assholes like you <laughs> For sure. on the daily <laughs> um so yeah they checked me out and they were like what happened the doctors and i was just like yeah i got punched a couple times and they're like oh and everything was fine like 
broken nose, but nothing serious. You would have uh, still been really like still tripping though at this point, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, that wouldn't have ended very quickly. <laughs> no, no, I'm still in it like full bore. Um, and then they take me from there back to the police station uh, and essentially tossed me in a drunk tank to sober up uh, for the night. Um, and it was one of those things where I was, I remember like now looking back on it, I remember a lot of what happened that night. Uh, it's not like it was just all blank. Um, but the one part that really stands out is when I was sitting in that drunk tank in that jail cell at the end of the night. Um, and I, I was like touching my face and my forehead and stuff. And I was, I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm ready to wake up now because to me, none of it had happened. It wasn't real. It was just some crazy dream that I was having. Right. Uh, And it wasn't until I felt the crusted blood under my nose and the big massive welt on my forehead uh, that I got smacked upside the head with reality that it had actually happened. Uh, And that moment of realization was the most humbling, terrifying realization that I I don't want to say that I've ever had, but it is up there, man, like top three for sure. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so did, were you was, charged with anything? Like, did this sort of follow you more than a memory or? Oh yeah. It was just public intoxication. I got like a hundred dollar ticket. Like a it, fine. Yeah. D- yeah. I, I don't even know if that goes on your record. Like, even if it does, it's, it's a minor offense, you know, it was nothing, nothing right. major at all. Um, I didn't have to go to court or anything. Like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so you did kind of get away with a bit of a mild, I mean, it's, it, it could have been a lot worse, but yeah. Sounds like, uh, sounds like you probably had a bit of, g- gave your head a little bit of a shake afterwards. Did you continue to like recreationally use, uh, like mushrooms after that? And if you did, were you more careful about like how much or what you were taking? You know what? That was the, that was the reality check that I really needed at that point in my life. Uh, kind of like how I was saying that I was, I was getting a little out of hand with the drug, drug experience or uh, with the drug use, especially with smoking weed. Um, that was kind of the, the thing that I needed to just be like, yo, man, you got to think about this. You got to be careful and you got to really realize the impact it's going to have on your life and others' lives. And yeah, it was, it was good. It was really good for me to have that happen. Uh, not to say that I've never done mushrooms since then. Uh, I have, but I could probably count on one hand how many times I've done them since then. And even when I do them now, it's, I do maybe a half gram and it's during, it's at a party, you know, everyone's having drinks and we're all hanging out and it's just like a small little thing that I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll just for the sake of it. But, uh, no, not at all what I, it's not at all what it used to be. Right. For sure. How old were you when, when that, uh, that experience happened? It was university. Yeah, it was like first year university or second year university or something. Okay, right yeah. on. So you'd have been like 19 or something 19. like that. Yeah. Yep, right around there. Right, yeah. I think the biggest thing for sure is just that I didn't really have any like deep-seated underlying major issues in my life uh, at that point. And even to this day, I don't. Like it's not like I had had any serious trauma when I was younger or anything, which I think is a major player when it comes Huge. to people suffering from addiction uh, or even an actual chemical imbalance in the brain. Like I've not ever been diagnosed being bipolar or uh, suffering from depression. Um, So for me, it was like I had an an awesome upbringing. I had awesome parents, friends, family, and it was just, I just enjoyed those experiences until I, (laughs) <laughs> got smacked across the face with a really heavy one and realized, okay, this is powerful shit. I should be really careful. <laughs> wow. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So you, it, it was all kind of your own realization then. it wasn't like your parents sat you down or was there ever a time that your parents or friends were like, Hey man, you know, you got to cool it. Yeah. Yeah. My parents, they know, they definitely parent, man, they see y'all. You can't get past them. Uh, I was living with them when I was really heavily into smoke and weed. So I know that they, they saw it and they saw a change in my personality. I was just really, really, I don't know. I was, man, 
I was a pain in the ass, to be honest, to live with. Uh, I was not a nice guy. Well, and, in like uh, what way? You were like, what do you mean? Like negative or you just yeah, like didn't feel super, like doing shit? Super negative, really snappy, no patience. Whenever I was asked to do something, just like basic shit. Like, hey, man, we're cleaning the house today. Can you help out? I would always give attitude when it was like, man, just fuck, give your head a shake, man. Like <laughs> you live here. The least you could do is clean the damn place up, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think we definitely all go through that kind of stuff. But you, yeah. you kind of attribute it to it. Do you think drug use was kind of like, was that just like a part of being a teenager? Or do you feel like it was drugs that were making you that way? Or like, what do you feel? Yeah, man. Well, everybody gets to that point in their life where you are old enough and mature enough that you could go out and live in the world by yourself, but you're still living at home with your parents. And you think to yourself kind of like, man, like, no, I don't want to do this. And if I was living by myself, I wouldn't be doing this right now. I would do it eventually, but on my own terms, and I don't want to be told to do it. So there's totally like that young, authoritative, I'm going to have it my own way kind of mentality. (laughs) That stubbornness, really, (laughs) of being a teen. Totally. Uh, And then you couple that with the fact that I was smoking so much weed to the point where I was like totally docile and zombified and and really just super irritated man I'm sure I wasn't getting decent sleeps I wasn't living a healthy lifestyle so my body was probably like dude I hate hate you you. (laughs) (laughs) I hate you you suck (laughs) shut up body (laughs) so you couple all those things together and hey man that just makes for a pretty a pretty nasty teen for sure so after that experience in Guelph uh you were backpacking in uh South America was it central central America central right right Nicaragua and uh what was your what was your experience there with a buddy of yours yeah, um, at that point, um, we were just kind of traveling around. We were supposed to travel for 30 days, and we were about nine days into our trip. Uh, and, and the person I was traveling with, uh, he was a, like a big-time smoking buddy of mine back home. Um, I had had that Guelph experience a few years prior, so I was a lot less into it uh, at that point in time. But he hadn't really had any like big reality checks in his life, so he was still pretty heavy. Uh, a pretty heavy smoker. Um, so we were cruising around, uh, and he was saying how he was like, man, we should totally try and try and find some weed. And I was all for like, if a local had approached us and had a joint and asked if we wanted to smoke, I would have been down just, you know, to do something like that, but I wasn't going to go out of my way to find it kind of thing. He was pretty keen on the idea. He actually bought a beanie (laughs) <laughs> that he figured would make him look like more of a stoner so that he would be approached <laughs> by dealers. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a great plan. And, uh. and you know what? As weird as it sounds, it fucking worked. <laughs> Whoa, okay, right on. Jeez. So he was. we were walking through this like really sketchy market uh, in like some really odd back alley uh, in Granada. And he got approached... Uh, and was like, hey, man, you want to buy some weed? And Ben was like, yeah, I totally do. And the guy was like, okay, you got to come back to my house. And I was like, yo, man, this is like beyond sketchy. Let's get out of here. And Ben's like, I'm going, I'm going. I'm like, you know what, man? I've done this before. I've had this crazy experience. I don't need another one. You're on your own if you want it. And he's like, I'm going. I'm like, all right, cool. So I went back to the hostel. He showed up like 20 minutes later. And had this like huge bag of weed. It was like a half ounce or something. And I was like, oh my, this is so unnecessary. Why did you get so <laughs> what much? What are you gonna do with all that? <laughs> yeah. And then he's he gonna would... open like a baking, like a bake <laughs> shop, or would yeah. your beanie just totally turn you into like a, you know, he's like a, an entrepreneur all of a sudden? <laughs> Pablo Escobar over here. Man. Yeah, Holy. The hell? White boy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Patrick Escobar. (laughs) Uh, So, uh, yeah, he was saying how, like, he couldn't buy a small amount. The smallest amount that this dealer would let him buy was a half ounce. But even still, the half ounce was, like, $20 when you you did the conversion. It was crazy. So we rolled up a joint, and we smoked it, and it was, like, horrible. Absolutely horrible. Like, you're freaking smoking straw, man. Like, this stuff was wretched it burnt your throat it tasted horrendous and it barely even got you high like just was not worth any of the risk that he had put himself through so anyways it was our last day in Granada and the next day we were going to go to Lyon and I was like okay man like we're getting in a cab and we're traveling to the next town let's just ditch it like you paid 20 bucks for it who cares 
And he had the mindset. He was like, well, we're going into Costa Rica the following day. So he's like, why don't we just take it to Lyon? And then uh, when we leave Lyon to go to Costa Rica, we'll ditch it then. I was like, man, this is not a good idea. Like traveling with it in a foreign country, like bad news, man. But he was persistent. Uh, So we packed it away. We hailed a cab, uh, went on our way, got about halfway, and then were stopped by a police check because there's this main road that runs through Nicaragua, which is notorious for cocaine uh, Mm. travel from Colombia down south. So they have these random, like, little drug stops along the way with like, it's like spot checks or whatever. Yeah. You got it, man. Cops with Uzis and stuff like that. Like these semi-automatic rifles and everyone's wearing like military gear. It's really so different, right? It's just, yeah, it's terrifying, man. Yeah. You see these guys and you're like, you could kill me like in an instant. And out here, like, who knows what would happen? Like, just ditch my you body. You may just never be heard of or seen again. Like, it, it, I mean, shit like that happens. Dude, it was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So we got stopped, obviously, because we're two white boys. Oh, forgot to mention, at this time, I had dreadlocks. So if right. that's not uh, a red and flag. And your buddy still needed to buy a beanie? I yeah. mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's a good point. Maybe the beanie did nothing. It was he just He should have just hair. put you on, on, you know, on his head or like you go jump on his shoulders or something. And it's, it works <laughs> yeah. the same way. With a big trench coat and we'll kind of do yeah, a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nine feet tall. Yeah. Uh, so you could, do you they feel like you had a little bit of a target on you then? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, and we were clearly foreign. So when they stopped us, they were like, well, man, these guys, something up with them. Uh, maybe they could smell our fear too. <laughs> so probably we got out of the car. Uh, they searched our bags. Sure enough, found it. Took us into the police station. Ben was arrested. Uh, I was released because I didn't have anything on me, so I was technically not at fault. And then it was a crazy process of contacting the embassy, uh, calling home to my parents, which was the absolute worst feeling in the world, Um, getting in touch with Ben's parents, who were on this little cruise just off the coast of Costa Rica, which is like super ironic because they could... They literally docked and then flew into Nicaragua like next day, you know? Wow, man. Um, But it was, yeah, he was in prison for 18 days and it was just a matter of paying off the judge, the, the lawyers and the prosecutors. And I think, I think that all in all, Ben's parents ended up paying like something like 20 grand. Uh, Holy crap, man. But since it's such a corrupt system down there, they basically took the money, they gave his passport back, and he has no record. He could return to Nicaragua at any day, and it's not even an issue. So those papers just went missing. Oh, you know, I don't know what happened. What What happened to that guy? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, man. So did you, you like stayed there the entire time to, or not the entire time, but like basically facilitating the like telling people about stuff and getting people to come to rescue him. Like you kind of brought him food and stuff. I remember you telling me that. So like, what was that like? You just all of a sudden you're by yourself and you're taking care of a friend who's in prison. Like (laughs) that must've been crazy. Yeah, it was, it was terrifying, man. Just that whole the whole thing, especially like having so many hours of the day, just sitting, thinking to yourself, okay, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And then you get to a point where you're like, okay, I've done everything that I can think of that I can do. So what do I do with myself now? How do I just kind of handle my own, uh, anxiety? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, so the way that the prisons there work is they give you food and water, obviously, like they have to. But being a third world country, the food that they give you is a spoonful of gallo pinto, which is rice and beans. That's You get a spoonful of gallo pinto every day and some water, and that's it. Um, but if you have friends and family outside of the prison, they can bring food in for you. Right. So one of my first visits with Ben, because I got to visit him uh, just to like discuss what we were going to do. And it was cool because nobody at the police station spoke English. So we could speak English to each other and it was like code. So the cops didn't know what we were saying. So we could kind of build a plan together to figure out what's going on without the cops knowing. Um, so the first thing we were like, okay, I'm going to bring food for you every day, lots of food. And I was going to, and Ben was like, okay, and I'm going to share it with the people in the the cell. I'm going to make buddies. I was like, boom, huge, big move. Smart. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I would bring like full pizzas every day and like big two liter things of pop, and he would just share it with all the guys. And he's he said by the end of those eighteen days, all the the guys that were in the cell, like they were teaching him Spanish. He was like reading his oh, books to them. Like it was kind of, it sounded like a kind of cool experience in the end. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for all intents and purposes, probably you'd want to avoid it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, once Ben's parents got back, uh, they, they got back. I, it wasn't next day. It was like three or four days after he was arrested. Uh, and at that point, my parents were like, get the hell out of that country because it's so corrupt. At any point, I could have delivered food and they could have been like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll toss you in jail as well because we want to make... Absolutely. Why not? If they, yeah. If Ben's parents showed up, they could have viably been like, oh, these guys want to pay some money for this kid. Well, this other kid's worth it. You are with him. You like, yeah, I totally get that. You got to kind of cut it and run as soon as, as, as he was safe with his parents, I guess, and yeah. let them take care of it. I mean, there's not much else you could do. It sounds like... Oh, it was, it was the worst experience too, man, because he's my brother, you know, he is my non blood brother. And for me, I felt like it was such an abandonment just being like, okay, see you, bud. I'm going back home. You're still in prison. It was, it was so hard, man. It was so hard for me to, to do, but I totally understood. I understood why we had to do it. Um, and the importance behind it and and just like the importance it had with my parents too, for them to be like, we need to make sure that you're home and safe and secure. So I, yep. fl- I flew back and Ben's parents dealt with the rest of the mess down there. And yeah, 18 days later, he came home and... Uh, they and shipped yeah. him off to Yellowknife. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're going up to the territory. See you, buddy. <laughs> Get on a plane. We don't want you. <laughs> uh, wow, yeah. That's... So that was that was the second experience that really rocked me, um, uh, especially when it came to drugs. But more so than just drugs, it really just made me realize uh, how how much control you have over your own life and how powerful the decisions you make can be uh, on, on your life and, and on, on how you choose to live your life. And it was really, you know, I look back on it now and I'm like, man, I really wish. <laughs> I, I, would not, I would rather have not experienced that. But at the same time, I think it was a really good thing for me to have experienced. Uh, and... I mean, if nothing else, it'll be an amazing story that I can tell my grandkids when I'm like 80 years old. <laughs> yeah. The time I was in Nicaragua, yeah, I man. was uh, with my friend. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, your grandpa but, has all those stories where you're yeah. like, grandpa, that's amazing. You're so cool. Yeah. I got one now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you have yours. Now you can just take a rest and never do anything like that yeah. again. <laughs> and you're good. So, you know, some of us have to discover these things. But <laughs> I think you're, you're all full on the great grandkids stories. You're good. Yeah, you're good for so. now. Um, do you find that like when you look back on a scenario like that, uh, do you ever have like a feeling of why the fuck didn't I just grab the bag from him yep. or like, and just toss it into the woods and be like, you're being an idiot and like move on. Yep. Like, do you have that feeling or do you really just say no, as is it just, you know, that's fine. Like what, what's your opinion on that? I think in any experience where things didn't go the way that they could have gone or should have gone, you always replay it in your head as to how the actions, the new actions that you could have taken would have affected the situation. Um, and I definitely look back and think at that, at that friend, he is, he can be very persuasive, uh, not in a bad way at all, but he is just very good uh, at making you see his own way and having you get on his side. Um, and I think that I should have realized that a little bit more in the moment and been like, Nope, we're not, I'm laying down the law. It's not happening. Uh, and then, yeah, that whole thing would have been avoided. However, he has changed so much from that experience and he has grown, uh, as a human being so much from that, that a part of me is really happy that it happened for him. That, that was his Guelph. That was to him what Guelph was to me, you know? Right. Yeah. People think, oh, weed, man, it's all cool. But like, it still gets you into trouble regardless. (laughs) And, you know, it's, it's probably best that, We try to stick away from it. But in that, (laughs) like, I mean, um, with these experiences, do you, have you found that you are no longer a recreational user for those reasons? Or do you recreationally use drugs or like, how does it fit into your life right now? I think that I've found a pretty awesome balance with it. Um, I'm not going to lie and say that I never smoke weed anymore, but 
I'm probably at the point now where maybe I smoke once, maybe once a month, if that kind of thing. And it would it will only be like if we're out at a party or we're with friends and it just happens to be there. And yeah, sure, I'll you know I'll have a puff or whatever because it's fun. I still enjoy it, um, but I don't have that nagging need to smoke, uh, which is something that I used to have before. And I'm really happy that I don't have that in my life anymore because now I can really focus my time and my energy uh, towards things that are going to make me a better person uh, and make my life much more fulfilled and happy. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's fantastic. So at the end of um, my, you know, podcasts now, I want to incite some sort of um, kind of retrospective talk about life. I'm wondering, I'm, I want to ask you what inspires you, um, what you hate or dislike. I'm not, I hate the word hate, but I mean what yeah. you dislike and uh, your hope or faith for sort of, you know, the future. So what, what inspires you? What inspires me? Um, people around me, my friends and my family, seeing their best traits and wanting to add that to my own arsenal. (laughs) Uh, That's a huge inspiration for me. I also find inspiration through books, uh, through blogs and podcasts. I'm huge into uh, self-help, self-improvement, and just self-betterment, being the best person that you can be. Um, There's this amazing podcast. I got to do a little pitch. Uh, It's all good. It's called The Art of Charm. And... uh, Jordan Harbinger is the host, and he has some incredible guests on that just span from everything from uh, uh, nonverbal communication to uh, being a more positive person and having more positive thoughts to like the miracle morning routine, all these really amazing things that just, and as I've started to like implement that into my life, I've, I've found some incredible improvements. Sweet. So the next one's what's uh, something that you dislike? Something that I dislike. Um... I really dislike people who have negative things happen to them, but don't do anything to correct it. I think that <laughs> there's... <laughs> I'm nodding my head obnoxiously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to do the um mm-hmm, mm-hmm, totally, yeah, yeah, over top of people, but I'm just like, yes, yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with that one. Because the reality is everybody has shit in their life. It, it's life, man. There's no such thing as life being fair. Life is what it is. And you've just got to deal with the cards that you've been dealt. And I think that there's so much power in looking um, at your situation from the outside as a whole uh, and seeing how you could react in a situation differently or how you could do something differently or treat someone differently and what kind of a positive impact it could have on yours and others' lives. Uh, It's much harder to do uh, and actually implement, uh, something that I'm still currently working on, and I think that I will always work on it over my entire life. Um, But that's a huge thing that really bothers me, because you you have the power to dictate the course of your life. Your life is your life. No person, no entity, no outside force is going to control you to do things or be someone. It's your life. Take control. I put down hope and faith, but um, there's like this little thing that I heard Jim Carrey talk about. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw this. It's just a random video that popped up on my Facebook feed and it was him talking at like a commencement. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this wicked quote that sort of inspires this next question. And it's, uh, he says, hope walks through the fire. Faith leaps over it. Magic happens when you stop hoping and start knowing. And I love that so much. Hmm. So I'm not going to ask you what your hopes are for the future. I'm going to ask you what you have faith in for the future. Oh man, that is, uh, my hopes for the future. Um, I hope that I can be a more connected person with the people around me, uh, in my everyday life. I think that one of the major things that I can really improve on uh, is my keeping in contact with people and being a little bit more present in their lives. Um, And just the little bit of reaching out that I have been doing lately to friends and family has been mind-blowing. It's just incredible to see the positivity in a simple call and, hey, how you doing? Or... uh, 
oh yeah, last time we spoke, you were mentioning getting a, ju- a new job. How's that going? You know, it's just, it's, ah, uh, it's just so, it's so powerful. Um, being present and, and caring and showing that you give a shit. Yeah. Yeah, man. Because that's where you find your joy is when you hang up that phone and you've got a huge smile on your face and you know that you made them happy and it, it in return made you happy. It just, I think that that's something that I would really like to improve on and, uh, yeah, just keep getting better at That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap up there. And if you'd like to give a little plug on where people can find your wicked music. Yeah, you can find me online at Jonesy Jams. And that's kind of my handle on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Okay, awesome. And once again, Davey did our intro music, and uh, we'll be collaborating in the future on some other things. So I want to thank you so much for coming on, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Keep living an awesome life. And uh, yeah, thank you. Sincerely, thanks. Thanks for having me, Liz. This has been awesome. Right on, man. See you later. Ciao. I want to thank Davy Jones for letting me interview him today and getting all up in his personal business and for being so open, but especially for the theme music you heard at the start of this episode, which he created and composed like the boss that he is. You can find Davy Jones performing around the GTA. Check him out on Instagram and Twitter at Jonesy Jams and on Facebook under Davy Jones. Thanks, guys. We'll have another episode out to you next week. You can find us on iTunes by searching Faking It Podcast on our website at www.fakingitpodcast.com, where you will also find all of our episodes, bios, and show notes, and on Twitter at Faking It Podcast. Subscribe, share, and stay loyal. Until next time.